Here's the subject for tonight, natural solutions for chronic pain. I never start off my seminars like this, but I'm going to today. Because when you watch people on YouTube, doctors and stuff, they'll say, this is how bad it is. And I try to skip through that as, as fast as possible because we all know it's pretty bad. Whether you're talking about Crohn's disease or you name the disease. But regarding chronic pain, it's really bad. There's a million people with Crohn's disease and there's a hundred million people in the United States with chronic pain. So it's kind of a big deal. It's a third of the population. And it costs this much annually, you know, 600 billion annually. And uh, 100 million Americans in chronic pain. 165,000 deaths in the United States from pre prescription opioids between 1999 and 2014. That's a lot of people dying from medications. And it's just for pain. I mean, if you know how to solve uh, pain uh, naturally, then all of these uh, deaths are preventable. So it's $2,000 per person per year in the United States. And the total amount of, that Americans spend per year is like seven, it's over $7,000, of which 2,000 is regarding pain. Okay, so we're talking about various locations, knee and hip, uh, a third of people over 18 years old have that, and then half of people over 65 have knee or hip pain. Low back pain in 27% of people over 18, headaches and migraines 15%, neck pain 15%, facial pain 4%. So conventional treatments, 25 to 30 percent are uh, have a placebo response. That's huge. My worst, my most disliked thumbs down video on YouTube is about homeopathy, and the number one argument I get against homeopathy is that it's placebo. Well, what about narcotics and opioids and NSAIDs? It's 25 to 30 percent. This is a major aspect of all of modern health healthcare, and like. 25 to 30 percent is placebo. So, you know, if you want to compare placebos, my placebo is safer than yours, right? The homeopathy is safer than narcotics and opioids because narcotics and opioids will kill your liver, kill your kidneys, and kill you. Whereas homeopathy, at the very worst, is like drinking water. Okay, so it's ineffective in many situations because, and you'll see this in a later slide, it's a soup of chemicals in a location like the knee that's causing the pain and a lot of the painkillers are just simply trying to affect one ingredient in the soup. That's why they're ineffective in many situations. And narrow therapeutic windows and significant side effects like death. I had a woman, she was in her 70s, a grandmother. Turns out she was addicted to um, Percocet and her dealer was her medical doctor in Milan. And it killed her kidneys, and she died from Percocet. Paradoxical hyperjesia. What that means is that the painkillers cause pain within two weeks. So they've done this study where they take a screw and they create this pressure, let's say, on your thumb joint. And you say, after a certain pressure, you say, oh, that's too much. The pain's a 9 out of 10. And then they record it. They put you on a drug, and then they do it again, like three days later, and you can take more more pressure and there's less pain and that's the that's what they're going for but after two weeks they do it again and with less pressure there's more pain than even the first time around because the drug causes the pain all right and I see and I see this all the time I for one period of my career a number of years ago I had a psychologist who specializes in chronic pain he sent me about 80 patients and they're all on Vicodin. And I'm telling you, there's no supplement, and at the time, no diet that I knew of. This is like five, six years ago. I got better answers now. But at the time, um, out of the 80 people, I think I helped less than five. And most of them didn't start anyways, because, well, to be honest, they were on disability. And if they got off the painkillers, they would lose their free money from disability. Right? So that's a trap right there. You have to stay on your medications in order to receive your free money from the government. And I have references here. Okay, there's three types of chronic pain. You got nociceptive, which is a tissue, like your, like your muscles are achy. So tissue focus. Okay, and then the achy muscle stimulates the nerves. The second one is neuropathic. It's the nerves that hurt, like sciatica, that shooting pain down your leg. And um, it says dysfunction within the peripheral, meaning like the leg, or the central nervous system, like the spinal cord or the brain. 
as a, re as a result of di injury, disease, or inflammation. And the third type is psychogenic, so it's mental, emotional, behavioral focus. And you can become more and more, you can have more and more psychogenic pain brought on by other pain, right? And that's which I'll get into here in a second. Okay, and that's called sensitization. So you become sort of uh, sensitized or a little hyperreactive, if you will, to um, pain or other stimuli, stimuli in your environment. But sensitization is crucial for recovery and survival uh, after an injury. So you want to avoid more pain because you're trying to recover from the pain that you got from before. Okay, so it's pain amplification. It has an evolutionary re relevance. It keeps you alive. However, sensitization perverts the beneficial aspects of hypergesia. So, so what that means is that um, <clears throat> it, it can get worse. Like uh, the natural evolutionary aspect of better survival um, <coughs> creates more pain in it. Um, it kind of perverts the healing cycle, if you will, because you can get used to it. New perspectives. Chronic pain does not solely originate from the nerves. That's a new perspective in the research. And chronic pain is the result of complex interactions between the nervous system and immune system and the hormone system, right? And I kind of mentioned like a soup. Okay, so this is willow bark. This is a big willow tree, white willow tree. And from this comes aspirin. The Native Americans used willow bark as, as a tea and they drank it to get rid of pain. Then along comes Bayer in the 1800s and they started uh, uh, extracting sal um, salicylic acid and that was their one active ingredient that they found was important in the tree but the Native Americans knew you don't want to just go for the one active ingredient because this is a soup of, of an herb that you want to use to address the soup of um, pain chemicals in your knee. Does that make sense? You want to have a complex of the herbal tea as opposed to one ingredient only. Okay, now uh, about five, six weeks ago I was in Australia and I was learning from MediHerb and they're an herbal company and I'm going to talk about some of their products and this is not a picture of inside their production facility. This is not from, we were not allowed to take cameras in there. But I just went online and I found some things that might look similar and it's like just imagine these big st stainless steel tubes and they pack it with plants like leaves in here and roots in here for example and the uh, cylinders are different sizes depending on that plant or, what they're, or whether they're using um, a, a, uh, a leaf or a, a root or a tuber or a resin. So they have different sizes and some are narrow, some are, are bigger. Then they pour alcohol on the top and sometimes the alcohol is like 90%, sometimes it's 65% depending on what they're extracting. The alcohol se soaks through and then they collect it at the bottom and that's how they get an herbal extract. That's how they get a liquid. They take that liquid and they do another process and they turn it into tablets. Okay, so they do that with willow bark and uh, here's a study that was done on uh, 436 patients with osteoarthritis and chronic back pain and or fibromyalgia from 74 different centers, medical centers, healthcare centers. 59% of the patients had pain for more than five years the pre-existing pain medication could be continued. They took um, a, a correct dose of willow bark every day for 24 weeks. They, pay, they measured the pain every six weeks and they had a weekly diary. 277 patients completed the study. Improvements are observed at three weeks and continue to improve over 24 weeks. So continuing here, um, it was equivalent of eight grams of willow bark per day. So imagine eight grams of the bark itself, and then they had the extract from it, the liquid extract, which you know was would be 120 to 240 milligrams per day of the active ingredient of, of salicin or the salicin um, um, group, a, a family of chemicals in the willow bark. Okay, so actually the amount that they took was 400 milligrams by pill, 400 milligrams but it was this much of the salicin uh, family and it equal to eight grams of the actual willow bark itself. Do you follow me on that? That's the right dose. Okay, traditionally um, herbal doses start off at two grams per day and it could be four, it could be six, it could be eight, but it starts off at two per day. 
not 100 milligrams, but 2,000 milligrams. Okay, so how to use willow bark. Patient requests, or request patients start a log diary, record the number of painkillers used per day and per week after four weeks review, and the majority of patients will see a decrease in painkiller usage. So I'm talking about all the different types of painkillers that exist, all right, not just some of them. We're just, it doesn't matter. In difficult cases, continue with willow bark for six months to achieve best results. Okay, so six months is a good time trial for these products. So here's Boswellia. This is a tree um, in the Middle East, and you cut, you can cut it like this, and you get this resin seeping out. Then you scrape that, like with a, a knife or whatever, and you put it into a bag, and it dries up, and there it is. This is Boswellia. Okay, so Boswellia significantly increased the threshold pain and time to threshold. So you have this amount of discomfort, and before it becomes pain, that threshold is higher with Boswellia. And then it also, um, it, you could also tolerate more force on that, that uh, test I was talking about where you put pressure on the, on the, thumb, on the uh, thumb joint. Okay. Um, so in this study, they took different measurements at one, two, and three hours with a single dose of Boswellia. And um, beneficial effects are demonstrated in all these different kinds of pain and inflammation. So it includes asthma. Here's brain inflammation, including radiation damage. Here's you know, a bowel disease, of course, the arthritis, colitis, type 1 and 2 di diabetes, cluster headaches. This is all inflammation. You know, so in, um, for like more than 10 years in the medical research, they're saying inflammation causes disease which is a true statement. But I, the next question is, well, what causes the inflammation? Well, it could be heavy metals. It could be chemicals. It could be too much sugar in the blood. Okay, but you always want to find the cause of it. And then you can uh, take something like Boswellia to help you right now get rid of the pain and inflammation. Okay, here's references on that previous slide. So the clinical evidence overall for Boswellia in osteoarthritis is good. And then suggestions from some trials that Boswellia might be disease-modifying rather than just providing symptom control. So disease-modifying is a big deal, okay, because NSAIDs and opiates and narcotics, they're not disease-modifying. They cause disease, <laughs> whereas Boswellia and some other herbs actually fix the disease, even if it's, whether it's diabetes or osteoarthritis or you know, all those previous diseases I mentioned, because it's addressing the chemical soup that the body is making. And there's a, there's a pathway, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> there's a pathway <coughs> in the body called NRF2, and uh, it's facilitated through, uh, uh, through the genetics. But uh, a lot of these herbs also grease up the NRF2 path pathway, which has a, plays a big role in health. Okay. Um, Here's another one, uh, clinical evidence from Boswellia. In this one, they took 1,000 milligrams a day, and it was uh, standardized to 40% Boswellic acids. That's the name of the, the family of chemicals in Boswellia that has its best effects. Okay, and every plant, every herb has that. There's a family of chemicals that um, MediHerb likes to <coughs> potentize and increase in those, in those tablets. So eight weeks, 30 patients. Um, and it was as effective as a COX-2 inhibitor over six months. It's a big deal for certain types of arthritis. But Boswellia extract is plant, just as good as a COX-2 inhibitor. 1,000 milligrams a day. Boswellia had a slower onset of action. It took longer. However, its effect <coughs> persisted after discontinuation of therapy. And I have a graph on that. I'm going to show you that graph. Okay, so Boswellia disease modifying. <clears throat> so here we go. Here's the NSAID right here, the green line. Boswellia is the blue line. This is at the beginning baseline. Here's one month, two months. Here's six months right here, right here. So they both decreased pain over six months equally, and then they stopped it. They stopped Boswellia and they stopped the NSAID. And here's what happened with the people who stopped Boswellia. 
their pain dropped a little bit more over the next month, on the seventh month. But the people that stopped the NSAID, the pain went up like this. So that's like incredible right there. And uh, so and a lot, as, the, as you're taking more and more of this, it's also killing your liver, killing your kidneys, making you grumpy, changing your personality, and all that stuff. So there's a plug for Boswellia. Okay, stiffness. Boswellia versus NSAID. So the Boswellia took a little bit longer to, and they finally meet up right here at six months. And again, they stopped both therapies at six months. And this is what happened with the NSAID people. Their stiffness went almost right back to where it began within four weeks of stopping it. Whereas the people on Boswellia, they stopped it and they still had uh, this lower amount of stiffness. All right, difficulty performing daily activities. Same thing, Boswellia versus the NSAID. Here's the Boswellia, it took a little bit longer. And at the end of six months, it still wasn't as good as the NSAID, just by a little bit. But they stopped it, and the, per the, pers the people here were still doing really well with their daily activities. So walking and shopping and all that stuff. Climbing upstairs, and the people on the NSAID, they had trouble again. Okay, so in order to have um, Boswellia bioavailable in your body, consume it with a high-fat meal. It improves bioavailability by a factor of five. And that makes sense because fat decreases inflammation in your body. So it's helpful there. And I'm sure there's other reasons why that I don't know about. <clears throat> so here's Boswellia. Add a high-fat meal. Cheese, fatty meat, oil supplements, nuts, butter, eggs, oils, avocados. <coughs> to get improvement times five. Okay. So let's talk. Now I'm going to talk about three different herbs. Thank you. Now these three herbs are combined into one product. From Medi Herb. And this one product is called um, Nervagesic. Let me just grab these right now, these three. <clears throat> okay, so the one that was uh, the willow bark is called sal <coughs> Salagesic. That's what that's called. As in salicylic acid, but it's more, um, br uh, it has a broader name, Salagesic. Here's Boswellia complex, the one I just talked about. And it has other things in there. It's got celery seed fruit. So celery seed fruit is really good for pain in the joints and the toes, like the fingers and the toes, the little joints. And it's got ginger, which is really popular, and turmeric. So those are all four of those are super healing for joints. Not to mention the Boswellia in there. Here's Nervagesic. Okay, so, here, so Nervagesic has California poppy in it which is an analgesic, mild sedative, hypnotic, and anxiolytic. So it helps calm you down. It contains a wide range of alkaloids. That's the chemical family in the California poppy that um, uh, has its greatest effect. Effective long-term dose, uh, 400 milligrams of a 4 to 1 extract twice a day. So how much is that? Like if you have just pure California poppy, that'd be 400 times 4, 1,600 milligrams twice a day, 3,200 milligrams a day. Okay, that's the dose for California poppy, okay, of the actual plant. And then you get the extract, and you, it's a smaller dose, but it's still equal to that amount per day. Okay, um, moving on here. Cori Dallas, this is the second one in Nervagesic, commonly used in Chinese medicine for pain relief, especially organ pain. Analgesic, mild sedative, spasmolytic, and hypnotic. It contains around 20 alkaloids, and it talks about two more, two that are very potent in it. But again, alkaloids, that's the family, chemical family found in Coriolis. And um, they do not interact with opioid receptors in the body, but they do react with dopa, dopaminergic this system. Okay, the third ingredient is Jamaican dogwood, analgesic, sedative, and antispasmodic. And... Uh, Traditional indications include insomnia, um, particularly when due to neuralgia, like nervous system problems, uh, restlessness, uh, sciatica, migraine, dysmenorrhea, muscle spasm, rheumatism. Okay, tr the traditional uses of these plants is, you know, it's documented. And that means people have been using these for hundreds of years, maybe thousands of years. Okay? So we can't discount the, the traditional use of our ancestors. Okay, Jamaican dogwood, uh, mild relief of abdominal, renal, or gallbladder pain. 
toothache, earache, painful infections of the eye, pain associated with fracture, whooping cough, to relieve spasm of asthma, effective long-term dose, 200 milligrams of a 4 to 1 extract. 2 times 4 is 8, so that's 800 milligrams twice a day, 1,600 milligrams a day for um, long-term. And then short-term, it's uh, a little bit more. Okay, so here's references on that in the research. Okay, so here's one hi history of a person with osteoarthritis. And this is a survey called the Womack um, scale or Womack survey. So it's asking you about how you're doing during your daily activities, how's your pain and that kind of stuff. So um, this one person had over the course of from baseline to nine months, their walking went from 65 down to 20. That's how much improvement they got. And then stair climbing from 75 to 30. And then during the sleep, they went from 35 to 20, and then rest they were doing pretty good five, from 5 to 0. And they could bear more weight from the score of 65 to 40. Their pain total went from 245 to 110. Their stiffness total went from 70 to 30. And then this is jumped to the grand total, one, or 1,160 down to 480. So that's a really good improvement. So I did, I did a graph um, for both of these. There's two case studies here. So here's Here's this one, patient one, and they're in the red. So it just shows you their overall improvement in their daily activities. It went from there to there over the course of nine months. Now patient two, same thing. We went from here down to here. And they got um, a 83% improvement, and the patient one got a 58% improvement. So here's patient two. You can just see their numbers, 65 to 5 with their walking. They're stair climbing 75 to 15. Their sleep got much better, 65 to 5. Um, weight bearing was from 55 to 15. Their pain total went from 265 to 40. This is with Nervagesic over the course of nine months. And their grand total went from 710 down to 119. So that's a great uh, story right there. And of course, you know, you, you want to address the diet. We're really good with that. I'm a big fan of ketosis. And some people have a hard time with that, but at least low carb, high fat even if you don't get into ketosis, you want to have that fat up to reduce inflammation. And you want to get that sugar and bread out and uh, carbs out, like especially the grains, because it's so inflammatory and causes so much pain. And I've heard so many stories about people realizing, when I eat bread, my pinky toe hurts. When I eat pasta, my whatever hurts. Something hurts. Headaches and stuff. I mean, I've had people where they eat bananas and they get migraines. It's a, it's a, you know, there's chemicals in these foods that, ca that cause inflammation and pain. Okay, so um, next slide. Now, M MediHerb has this equipment. Uh, I'm not going to describe it, but it's very expensive, and you put herbs into it, and it'll tell you whether or not you're looking at the real herb. So if somebody sells you echinacea, you run it through this machine, and you determine, is it really echinacea? Okay, so I'm going to show you. Um, this is echinacea here, and you can see these spikes right here. That's a little forest. Let's call that a forest. And here's a, a plain. Here's a little couple trees that are all by themselves, kind of lonely over there. But it has a signature from this machine. And um, they did an extract of some echinacea, and it came out kind of the same, but there's less trees like here. It's a shorter distance. This is a longer distance. And you can see that these trees are a little bit bigger. Okay, that's the extract. And then here's, so they combine the two and they, you end up with this. This is called Echinacea Premium from MediHerb. So I just want to show you that this is how they're thinking. They take the, net, the actual herb, they add to it the uh, family of chemicals that make it better, that are found in the herb, but they kind of enhance that and now you have this. Okay, that's how they're thinking. Okay, um, so I just, this is just to show you that they name the different forests and plains and trees. They have different names for it depending on the herbs. So this is called alkalamides, and here's sicoric acid, echinocoside. Okay, this is um, from echinacea. But they name them, and they use this to determine, yeah, this is echinacea as opposed to something else. Okay. Here's milk thistle. It's got these different characteristics. And they, and they point it out, and they run it through, and they say, yep, this is milk thistle, or nope, it's not milk thistle. So you can take a product from a health food store. You know, and there's other companies that have this. There's universities that have this machine. 
You can send it to them and say, hey, is this milk thistle? And they can run it through and they say yes or no. Okay, but you got it. The person that runs a machine actually has to know, right? They got to be the herbal, herbal expert, right? I just want to show you Prozac. Here's Prozac. That's it. It's one little stick. It has nothing that goes with it. And um, here's another antidepressant here. Here's metformin, the diabetes drug. Here's glyburide, another medication. See how simple that is? All right? See how stupid, stupid that is? Why is it stupid? Because your body is complex. You want something like this. This matches your body, right? These are super powerful. It takes time for them to work, okay? And these will save your life, but you want to get off these by doing the natural things, okay? And I really think that the, I've, seen, I've met herbal uh, researchers. I've met a, a few of them in my career. They're super smart. They're crazy smart. And they're dealing with this, and you've got to be smart to deal with this kind of stuff, the complexity of the plant and the complexity of your body. I've never, I've never met a big pharma scientist. Like, you know, I have met. <laughs> Pfizer used to be headquartered here in Ann Arbor. And I've met two Pfizer scientists, three, three of them. And um, anyways, they deal with that. That's simple. That's simpleton right there. OK, I just had to bash big pharma. Thanks. Thanks for listening. Now, here's. Um, this is an echinacea sample with the alkalamides, which is the active ingredient, here in the MediHerb uh, product right here. Here are, um, I think, nine other products from other companies. And they measured the quantity of alkalamides in their pills. And you can see that these are clinically irrelevant. They are clinically insignificant, and they won't help you because the amount of echinacea needs to be super high. You got that? So now I see, I keep my eye out on the retail herbal companies. As a matter of fact, yesterday I had a patient bring in a Boswellia, and I read the label, and the label is really correct. It's a good dose per capsule. And I, was, and I smelled it, and it smelled really good, and it looked right when I looked at the capsule. So that's you know, really cool. I think that the herbal companies that, are, that sell retail are getting better and better. Now, if you run that Boswellia capsule that I saw yesterday through the HPLC machine like, that I showed you, it may not show up as Boswellia. Or, you know, it may not have the right quantity of Boswellia in there, even though the label says it's correct. So these are just factors that uh, the free market will correct. Because, for example, I'm educating you, and then you know what to buy and not buy. And then the companies that don't do a good job, they go out of business. Okay. Okay, um, so I, I'm just showing you like that Womack pain scale. They had various uh, subjects like walking and stair climbing and rest and weight bearing. Okay, now that's it for the slides about treating pain with those three bottles. Okay, or disease modification related to pain with those herbs. Okay, so you can eat um, bad food and... Uh, do bad things with your lifestyle choices and still take those herbs and maybe get a good result. But of course you want to do healthy things with your diet, et cetera, et cetera. So this is what I typed up for uh, various other factors that need to be addressed. So lactic acidosis, I figured this out last, last year. It's the mechanism of chronic disease. It was well known between 1920 and 1960 and that needs to be addressed nutritionally. And it's, it's the mechanism of chronic disease, it's not the cause. The cause of chronic disease would be heavy metals, chemicals, infect chronic infections, hidden infections, of course, that's in that category, and also excessive carbohydrate metabolism, especially from grains and sugar. Okay, so, um, so if you have chronic pain and you want to get off your painkillers, and maybe you're addicted to them, they're very addicting, you start with these herbs, you got to give them at least six months, and you got to do this with your diet. Okay, so inflammation needs to be addressed, and it can be caused by the things I mentioned. Mold, fungus, yeast, candida, heavy metals, chemicals. Talked about that. Excessive man-made fat consumption related to healthy fats. There's a, a study that just came out where people were, were given lots of coconut oil, and another group was given lots of corn oil. 
and the people who had corn oil, their LDLs went up, and their triglycerides went up, et cetera, et cetera. And the people that had the coconut oil, all that stuff went down. So bad fats cause disease and inflammation, margarine, Crisco shortening, the, yo the yellow oils in the clear bottles. Okay. Um, the you can have structural and biomechanical problems causing pain. So I have a guy right now seeing me, and he hurt his back. He was lifting something up. He hurt his back, and it was bad. And um, he, um, I don't remember if he was seeing a chiropractor or not, but he wasn't getting any better after about five weeks or eight weeks. So I did the testing procedure that we do, and it was his ankles, believe it or not. I pulled on his ankles, and they both popped, pop. And he stood up, and he's like, oh, I'm better. His back was better. Sometimes that's all that takes. So he had aberrant, aberrant biomechanics of the ankles, especially the, the left ankle for him, causing the knee to not work right, the hip. And in the 1950s, there was a Russian physical therapist who figured out that you can have a bad left ankle, for example, causing problems with the mechanics of the leg, and it crosses over to the right shoulder. And it pulls the shoulder back, and then it impinges on the nerve going down the arm, and it can cause carpal tunnel syndrome on the right hand from the left ankle. So with my patient, when I pulled on his, his left ankle, he was saying that, he, he reminded me that he was having this horrible right, right forearm pain. Now at the time, he didn't have it. But, uh, but I explained this mechanism. He's like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Like his right arm was, causing, was having pain from the left ankle. Okay, so, and we have Dr. Vickers that works here. He's great with um, um, fixing up the muscular system and, the, and uh, turning on muscles that have been turned off. He's been doing it for over 25 years. He, he, addressed, he worked on my neck today. He's great. Okay, you can have bursitis from salt deficiency. That's, that, that's a home run. We have a supplement called kale ammo. It fixes bursitis. It's great. The need for drainage to release congestion of fluid from any part of the body, that can cause pain. So if you have sinuses that are congested and you got fluid buildup in there, it's pressing on your tissues, it's causing pain. And then leaky gut causing autoimmune problems. So if your gut is leaking these big proteins, when I say big, I mean they're like 20 amino acids long, they, they leak into your body and then your immune system sees that as a um, foreign invader and starts to attack it. Well, the problem is that big protein may look like your knee. Now your immune system starts to attack your knee. All right, so that's what leaky gut does, causes autoimmune problems. Okay, so if you want our help, um, here's our email address. And um, that's it.